Hi, I'm Renee. I'm a zookeeper here at the National Zoo and Aquarium in Canberra. And this here is Eilish. She's one of our red pandas. Now, red pandas are actually found in the high snowy ranges of Asia. To adapt to those cool climates, they have amazing fur. As you can see here, they have coarse, dense fur that covers their entire body. She also has a woolly undercoat. And to deflect the sun out of their eyes, they actually have a dark patch of skin called tear tracks under their eyes. In the really freezing cold conditions, to conserve energy, these guys will actually stay dormant, only waking to feed throughout the day. And that's how red pandas stay warm in winter. I'm Michael. I'm Eric. I'm Owen. And I'm Amy. Our project is the Coolant Box and it uses a 12 volt battery to power an old computer fan. It's like an esky, but it would be uh, like less heavy than an esky. And the actual shape, it uses aluminium sheets to make the actual box, but it uses polystyrene or foam to be an insulator, and it has cardboard on the outside because aluminium is a metal and metal conducts, so if it conducts hot air, it wouldn't be good. So we put cardboard around it so it doesn't conduct any hot air. The hardest part was probably knowing where to get everything. I thought the hardest part was actually like making the thing. It took about like maybe two weeks to plan it, um, but it took a lot longer to build it, yeah. After we got the idea, we just did nothing for a few weeks. It didn't turn out how we imagined. Because well, we thought the shape would be more streamlined than an actual, like, a box. And we also think the materials would be more con effective. And we didn't get to put any, like, comfortable thing, like maybe some cotton or some wool. And we didn't get to put any straps. It's actually not a bag. And, like, we couldn't make a flap so it could open. And we didn't make any bag features. <laughs> if I was to make it again, well, first of all, we would add the solar panels and then we would uh, build it up so there were more layers to actually store the food. One thing we would change is actually making another layer and putting straps on it so you can put it on your back. Could have made it taller, could have made it environmentally friendly by putting solar panels up top, connecting to a fan to make it generate and put more fans in. So this is what we were actually planning. So that is a 12 volt battery that we use to power the computer phone, which is over there. And then there's two wires that connect the battery to the fan. Then we have the aluminum sheet with like the little holes. So then the air can go through, but the food can stay on. And those cylinders represent like the drinks that we were going to plan to put on. And then we have back straps, so people so it's actually like a bag. Yeah. And so people can like carry it around, make it easier to carry it around. Like if, for example, if they're going bushwalking, they could just carry it around here. Yeah. Brr. Maybe I should take some tips from the red panda on how to stay warm. It's still so cold out here. I think I'm gonna get sick. Achoo! 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 A lot of people think that the cold weather makes you sick, but it's actually not the drop in temperature, but the drop in humidity that can make you sick. When the humidity drops, the air becomes drier, and that can dry out our eyes, the mucous membranes in our nose, and our lungs. And these are important levels of defense that our immune system uses to keep us healthy. When we get cold, our body can also start shaking. That's our muscles involuntarily contracting to generate heat to try and keep us warm. And we generally want to stay around 37 degrees for our body temperature. slopes of Mount Buller, Victoria, where Seb and I are going to test out ways to survive in the snow. The snow 
isn't just about snowballs and snowmen. It can also be very dangerous due to low visibility and low temperatures too. But as regular viewers will know, Sebastian and I bravely experience adventure and astonishing tales of survival on a daily basis. First things first, we went looking for experts in survival in the snow. Different animals have their very own way of surviving in the snow. Huskies often run long distances on very little food and have a thick double coat that keeps them well insulated from the cold. The super cute pygmy possum is the only Australian marsupial that hibernates for long periods of time during the winter. While the red panda can live up to 4,800 metres above sea level and are most commonly found in the Himalayas. We know how animals survive in the cold, but what about us humans? Did you know that humans can survive in the snow as long as they have access to three essential resources? Oxygen, water and shelter. They say there's a rule of three. Three minutes without oxygen or three minutes submerged in icy water. Three hours in a harsh environment without shelter. Three days without water if you're sheltered. And three weeks without food if you've got shelter and water. Me and Jackie are going to test out this theory. We're going to jump into the icy water and see how long we survive. What? what? No, I can't. Um, I just read that? the script. Really? Icy water? No, guys, it's a joke. It's a, Is it's it? Oh, yeah, no, no, they were joking. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. No. Yeah, no. Oh, uh, yes. Yeah, we knew they were joking. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> OK, yeah. Um, all right. Uh, let's go. OK. <laughs> While everyone else enjoyed the snow here at Mount Buller, Seb and I spent the day putting the scary survival rule of three to the test. Let's see how we went. Oh, we made it. Just. So what tactics did you use? Well, going by the survival rule of three, of oxygen, water and shelter, I walked around a bit and I was breathing, so oxygen, tick. So I started looking for water. Ah, and where'd you find it? Well, I brought some resealable bags and I filled them with snow and I put them between my jacket layers, to hopefully to melt it. It's a great idea. I didn't really even think about finding water. Oh, really? No. You're thirsty? No, I didn't get thirsty at all. Oh, okay. <laughs> so yeah, water is essential to keeping your nervous system running. But it didn't really work. <laughs> but that doesn't make it okay to litter though. So your nervous system sends and receives messages throughout your body so your brain can tell everything is running smoothly. So the more water you have, the warmer you are because you're hydrated? Mm-hmm. So, Seb, did you hide any household items in your jacket to take out there? I did. I was trudging through the snow. It was so deep. I was cold. My hands, my face, everything was burning. So I smuggled a newspaper, and the newspaper helps insulate you and protect you from the cold. I thought I saw you in a garbage bag. Yeah. I ripped it open and put it over my ears and around my neck. It kept out all that wet snow in the wind. It was really warm because you lose so much body heat through your head and your ears. So glamorous. Oh, it was freezing out there. Surviving without a shelter? I don't think so. You know what? My fingers and toes were beyond cold. They actually hurt, like they ached. Oh, my nose was running the whole time. My face was freezing. Trying to sleep under those leaves. You made a shelter out of leaves? I tried.
What shocked me about the rule of three was you could only survive three hours in a harsh environment without shelter. Yeah, there's nothing out there. There is just no natural materials to build shelter with whatsoever. I know. I searched and searched. I was climbing under sticks and trees, <laughs> digging in snow, trying to cover myself with anything I could find. It was impossible. Yeah. You can't even see anything. It's so white, complete white out. Couldn't see my hand in front of me. And being taller puts me at a disadvantage. Because I've got a larger surface area, I lose the heat quicker. It's just not my natural environment. So I'm better equipped because I'm shorter. But you know what? My long hair, not so good. It'll froze. Yeah, I saw that, like frozen noodles. <laughs> yeah, like egg noodles. <laughs> And the other thing I tried to do to keep warm was walking. Me too. The snow was so deep, it became a workout. I started sweating and then I got colder. Ah, see, that's the purpose of sweat. It's to keep your body cool. That's the exact opposite you want out there. Yeah, I bet. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, we tried. We survived. You know what, I think we taught everyone how not to survive in the snow. I agree. But you know what? We had so many people okay. around us helping us survive. I would never recommend going out to a blizzard on your own. The best place to be is at home. With a warm drink. Exactly. Speaking of, do you want a tea? Yeah, let's do it. So what are your symptoms? I've got this really sharp headache, just right there. And did it come on suddenly? It was really sudden, I don't understand. Have you been eating or drinking anything? I don't know, maybe. Hmm, I see. And uh, could it have anything to do with this? I just had some ice cream. Hmm. Come on, Doc, tell it to me straight. I think you have a very serious case of brain freeze. <laughs> we all get headaches from time to time, from tiredness, heat exhaustion, and stress. But the most common cause of a headache is actually ice cream. That's right, ice cream. An ice cream headache is the most common cause of headaches. You might know it as brain freeze. OK, well, that's my most common cause of a headache but I really, really love ice cream. Roughly one third of us will suffer this after eating or drinking something cold. The most common cause is something like a slushy or ice cream. And the best way to give yourself brain freeze, if you're feeling really crazy, is actually to drink a glass of ice cold water. 200 mils of water that's at about zero degrees Celsius and try and drink it as fast as you can. Okay, here goes. <laughs> pain should kick in roughly about 20 or 30 seconds after you've drunk the cold. Oh, there it is. Oh. Oh, it's right behind my temple. Oh, but it passes. There we go. It passes after uh, 10 or 20 seconds. But it's not a very pleasant experience. It's not actually your brain itself freezing. Your brain doesn't have any nerves to even sense pain. One theory for how this happens is that the cold actually makes the blood vessels in your mouth constrict or squeeze together and stop the blood flow. This is kind of like when you squeeze a hose in your garden and you stop the water from coming through it. When you release that hose, the water gushes back in. So as our mouth increases in temperature, that blood comes rushing back through and it causes the blood vessel to expand as it fills up with blood. And this is sensed by pain by the facial nerves in our head. You have one facial nerve in particular, the trigeminal nerve, and it runs down the side of your head and branches out across your mouth. And that's why you sense this pain, but it actually feels like you're getting the pain in your forehead, sometimes behind your eye. This is called referred nerve pain, and it's very common with nerve pain. Interestingly, people that suffer from migraines may be more susceptible to getting brain freeze. Because of this, there's some interest in trying to understand what causes brain freeze because maybe it can be used as a model to study migraines, like some of the pain medication you could take or how migraines cause the pain in the first place. For most of us, brain freeze is just something that goes away by itself, so it doesn't require any specific treatment or medication. 
and it doesn't require any major lifestyle changes either. So no ice cream ban for me, which is amazing because I love ice cream. I just got back from Antarctica where I saw some absolutely mind-blowing things. <gasps> Isn't that insane? For some of my favourite, the most cutest things I saw were seals. <laughs> seals are kind of like Antarctic furry slugs. They're a weird mix between a dog and a hairy old caterpillar. Seals are a little gross when they communicate with each other. It just sounds like they're doing a huge burp in the other seal's face. It kind of sounds like this. They do this because they're aggressive and they want to defend their territory. <laughs> or maybe they're looking after their little pup. Either way, it's stinky and it's not very nice. <laughs> Seals have special adaptations to keep them warm. They are able to generate their own body heat, just like us humans. They're mammals. They're endothermic or warm-blooded. But they also have a really thick layer of blubber which keeps them warm, like an insulator while they're swimming in the freezing cold water. <laughs> and while they're hauled out on land, their fur keeps them warm, especially when their fur is dry. Seals appear pretty awkward on land. They have to move on their bellies because they don't have the ability to walk on their flippers. Their front flippers are way too short. So they move like a slug across the ice. They use their back flippers to slide super fast to evade any predators or to help them catch a nice tasty fish. Seals use their whiskers or their vibrissae to detect vibrations in the water to help them to catch their prey like their fish or penguins. But it also helps them to avoid predators like orcas that would like to make a tasty meal out of the seals. One of the most interesting seal species I saw in Antarctica was the southern elephant seal. These guys are the largest seal. They weigh more than a rhinoceros. And the males, well, they have this cool inflatable nose called a proboscis, which can inflate and deflate depending on the season. Now, a word of advice. We get seals here in Australia. And while they look all cute and cuddly and we want to get close to them, we should really keep our distance because sometimes they can be aggressive. So just watch from afar. Safety first.